Well, hello everybody. Here we are at the Icon Awards critique sessions, and I have the pleasure of two lovely ladies who are also some two of the most talented photographers in the entire world. And we know that because they pick up awards all over the place. We have Martina Werdenfeld <laughs> from Sweden. Yeah. Good. And then we have Kelly Brown from Australia. I don't know, when you sound, her name, it sounded like, had this, when you go back to the Aussie names in Australia. <laughs> anyway, we are very lucky because not only are they very intelligent, but they're also very experienced and they also articulate themselves way better than I do. So I'm looking forward to what they're going to share with us in the portrait division of the competition, children and teenager, animals and pets. A quick reminder that what we're doing here is looking at images that got 79 or below. So these are images that did not receive an award. The, the judges, or, or Kelly and Martina, are going to share with us some of the reasons that may have kept them below the award standard, and also some of the things that could be done to lift them into that award standard. I'd like to thank B&H for their continued support of this program and, and the things that we're trying to do with the Icon International Photography Awards. And of course, Critique, and that's without a U or an E. Critique is the platform uh, and the app that you can get where you can see online critiques or critics of the, the uh, certain images and judges passing comments and showing you on the image, drawing on the image. It's incredible. You'll see a little video of the photographer with the image talking about what can be done. And there's hundreds of those online. Go to www.iconawards.com. You'll find all of this stuff. Incredible program, but let's get on with it. Just a little, a few words maybe about yourselves. Martina, tell us, you know, what you do and where you're from. I've already said that, but you know what I mean. So um, I'm from Sweden and I've been a professional photographer for 27 years and I shot like everything when it comes to people, weddings, fashion, families, and I've, like all of that. But a few years back, I found my true love in fine art portraits and that, that's mostly what I compete in as well. I do some pet photography, definitely children and teens, so I'm happy about this category today. Excellent, thank you, Kelly. All right, I'm Kelly Brown, I'm from Brisbane, Australia. I've been a photographer for 20 years. Most people know me as a baby photographer, but I like to say I'm not just a baby photographer. I love to photograph animals and pets. Um, I have actually created a book and photographed, a, I think it was about 60 dogs um, as babies, as newborn babies, and that was very, very very fun to do. Uh, children and teen is also a great passion of mine, um, so I'm really excited about what we're going to see. Cool. So, again, we're looking at children and teenager which was one of the categories, and animals and pets. And we'll see one from each one at a time. We may only do four or five. We might do eight or, eight or nine. We don't know. Let's get into it. Let's see what the, the uh, judges think of these images and what could be done to take them to an even higher standard. We'll start with you, Martina. All right. First of all, when I see this, it just popped. The colors were really fun. And the, to play with the both uh, pink and the blue against each other, um, it made me smile right off the bat. So that was fun. We, um, there are, for me, the, the, the thing that, that, that distracts a little bit is that a lot of things are going on that I think that maybe the author wanted to add it for the fun of it, but then there are lines like the two carpets down below. I'm not sure that they were necessary to be there. If they would have just kept the props against the walls, it would have been a little bit cleaner for me. What do you think, Kelly? Yeah, I totally agree. I think that there's a lot going on here. And a lot of, I mean, I think the light on the subject has been handled really well. However, that really quite direct light on all of the other elements does lead our eye to them. And it's created some quite contrasting shadows and some leading lines that take us away from the subject. When we photograph a fashion sort of styled portrait like this, we do have to be careful as well with our focal length. You can get down low and create some really interesting perspectives by using a wide angle lens like this. Um, however, when we do that, we start to sort of lose the impact of the subject because they become further away and quite small within the frame. So there's a lot of information in the background that doesn't have a lot in there. And then when we get to the bottom of the frame, it's weighted down, it's very heavy with all of those different elements that have come together. Uh, and I would just like to add also, since um, I, I, I'm such a, what do you call it, stickler for posing, 
that when you have the hands coming up like that, it's very important that you consider that hand on the top, it was sort of just sticking out of the head. So if, if that hand would have come down a little bit and you could have brought that elbow out, it would have helped that pose. And also the left hand, we are missing a couple of fingers in that image. If that would have moved out slightly more, it would have been nice to see the whole hand. Perfect. Yeah. One last comment in terms of bringing, you know, the contrast of two different colors together, like the pink and blue, there's a lot of variations of pink and blue here. If you're going to do pink and blue, make sure they're all in that same sort of, you know, color range. Um, you can do that easily in post-production and then make your lighting a little bit more even so that the you don't have the darker areas at the bottom of the frame and then the lighter areas at the top of the frame that do distract. I'll just add a couple of quick things. Uh, the vignette on this image, if you look at the top, it's quite, it's quite sort of um, a bit too harsh for this image. You can see it drop off very quickly at the top. And it's really important when you want to add props to an image, which is a great idea. I think it's most of the time, less is more. Sometimes we can put too much in and uh, it's not really adding any value to the image. It's just creating more distraction. Then on top of that, if you're going to have those props, put as much time into the placement of those props and make sure that they look a little bit more organized and not, not too messy, unless that's part of the styling, because a lot of people put a lot of time into posing the, the model, perhaps uh, getting the, the connection with the model and then drop a few things in around them. So you can see in this image, the color tones of those props and the color palette, apart from those little shifts in the hue, there's some good ideas happening, but there is a feeling like a lot of it's just been put there to hopefully help. Take some of them out, like on the left you've got some vases, you've got three vases, two with flowers, red and green. Take the green one out, take, the, take two of them out, leave one vase, pink vase, pink flowers, one white box. It would be a lot cleaner, a lot simpler. Make sense? Cool. Let's have a look at another one. I think that one's calling to you, Kelly. Oh, the expression on both of their faces. I love this. These guys are friends. And I think that the photographer's done a great job of, you know, animating that relationship for us. I love the cleanliness of it. Um, in terms of what could be improved here, the, the retouching on the little boy's face um, has just been taken a little bit too far. It does look a little bit cartoony. So we have to be careful when we're adding highlights and shadows that we don't we don't lose the texture and the detail and the realness of it because he's a beautiful boy and we've got a lot of texture and detail in his hair and then we've got a lot of texture and detail in the dog's fur but the some of the highlights have just been pushed a little bit too far on the boy's skin tones to make it look a little shiny and, and to give it that cartoon effect. I think you said it all. No, it's, it, that was like my main thing as well. Um, the only thing I can see to add to that is maybe giving it just a tad more space in the bottom. Um, I feel that I'm, they literally falling down out of the frame here. So if we could have just taken a little bit from the top, it still can be some negative space there, that's fine. But just, just a tad on the bottom. Other than that, like I said, fun, friendly. I'm sure the family Having something like that in a family album would be really fun to have. I, um, I really liked your comment, animating the relationship. I think you should all write that one down. That's a classic. <laughs> That's very important. Yeah. Moving further back with your focal length, coming down a little bit lower and then tilting your perspective up higher will help with what Martina was saying in terms of, you know, giving them a little bit more room. It will definitely change that perspective. I just also want to add in here in terms of the lighting, there's some great light coming across the front there. It's very soft, but the light in the background just seems to be a a little bit brighter than the foreground. So making that a little bit more consistent as well will help keep our eye on the subject as opposed to being distracted by the starkness of that white background. I wonder if the eyes of the little boy, they seem to be in that midpoint between looking back at the dog or maybe looking at us. And I think if I was judging this image, I would find it to be a stronger image if the little boy had the same expression but was looking straight down the camera or looking at the dog. At the moment, he's kind of in between and it kind of breaks what would have been even more impact. So good, good, yeah, go for it. I just saw two 
if that could have easily been done if if the boy would have been pushed back a little bit because right now he is slightly forward and the dog feels a little bit smaller so the perspective of that if he would have been closer to the dog backed up a little bit then that eyes would be easier placed towards the dog and maybe even just turn slightly more mm -hmm. towards the dog because he's facing us but he's looking nowhere the dog's sort of angled in, so we don't need to see where the dog's looking because of the angle, the gesture of the body is leaning towards the little boy. That's it. It's like mirroring the yeah. positioning of them. So yeah. the dog's on an angle, put the boy on an angle so that they, their bodies come together to create that connection. And that, that again, is a, a, is a part of that process of animating the relationship. I love that. All right, let's go to another one. Oh, wow. This has got a lot of impact and I'm, con you know, instantly sort of drawn to the connection with the eyes here. Um, unfortunately, though, my eye then quickly gets distracted by the, the light on the body, the placement of the hands and the hair coming across the face there. So we talked, we've talked before about, you know, um, obviously posing and, and positioning and things like that. Um, but when we, we want to add movement to a photograph, using any type of hairdryer or blower, you're not going to get the shot straight away. It's a process. You've got to position the, the, the constant flow of air. You've got to change the intensity of it to be able to, to get the hair just right, to create that beautiful soft movement. While she's got quite an intense look on her face, this could be quite softened down um, in terms of the movement of the hair and, and avoiding it coming across the face there and covering parts of her face. Just that piece at the top there where it's a little bit dark, sort of swooping across the brow, it creates a heaviness above the eyes there that takes you away from that, that beautiful connection in the I. Um, Matina, I'm going to let you talk a little bit more about the posing. Thank you. Um, this is, uh, I think it's it's a quite classical pose if you want to do uh, with giving some curves and, and accentuate her body like this. Having that um, upper arm coming so close to the camera with the light that you were talking about being so bright on that, it just makes it like the, the biggest part of the picture. And it really is where my eyes are going when I see this. And also, I think she's actually squeezing that in. And when we squeeze that in, you know what happens. It widens. <laughs> no, but it squeezes in and you get that little bit wideness, wideness in um, the arm. So if she would have, she could have had a little bit of softer hand on the, in the upper arm right there. And then just let that um, upper the upper arm, the upper hand is needs to be softer and then the upper arm just come out, just releasing a little bit from the body. It would have been that, it wouldn't have been as pressed and it would have been a bit more uh, relaxed pose. And then the lower hand. When we have that hand coming straight to the camera, it gets bigger, it's flat. So easily um, it could have been improved if that had been tilted or twisted a little bit. Yeah. Soft, soft it. Just so they could see it. Yeah. yeah so, so soften that a little bit instead of having that flat. So when she's leaning over, let me see this, she could have just turned ever so slightly with her hand and it would have been feminine, a little bit more attractive. And not, then also not with her hands, um, the fingers coming down a little bit. You almost get that little claw feeling of it. So just making that hand a little bit more delicate would have kept us going from the hand Instead of stopping by the arm, it would have led us up into that beautiful face. Can you just also mention, even when you, when, like as we see it here, the wrist break doesn't matter, but as you go sideways. Yeah, the wrist break is definitely, did I do that naturally? You did, but you, I was waiting for you to mention it and I thought, well, let's point that out. It comes naturally, yeah. Um, when you do that wrist, if you just ever so slightly tilt it, it becomes a more interesting angle and a bit more soft. Um, and, and everything that Martina's just said about that in terms of the arm looking larger because of the light source, that bottom arm, because it's slightly coming towards the camera, you can see that it appears smaller. 
And that's because the distance from the wrist to the elbow has been shortened because it's coming towards the camera. It's called foreshortening. And that's why that arm looks a lot smaller than that top arm. So your light, your focal length and your, your posing are going to play a big part in how you perfect your, the overall finish in terms of that pose as well. Just quickly, ladies, when we talk about teenagers and we're talking about a, a young lady here, um, you're talking about the arm and getting the big arms. Now, let's just flip that for a minute. If we were talking about a young man and maybe the boys want to have a little bit more, like, how would you use those principles you're talking about to complement a guy that might want, you know, do you know what I mean? Like, how do you operate with a body to say some people might like to feel bigger, some people don't? How do you guys handle that? You know what I mean, Kelly? Yeah, absolutely. So we use light and we use positioning to create form and shape. And what we're looking at here is, is you know, that four, that sort of, um, not forearm, what do you call this part of the arm? Uh, bicep, upper, upper, arm. upper arm, bicep area and shoulder. So if you were to photograph a young guy who wanted to look like he'd been at the gym every day, you photograph him like this, <laughs> literally. And you get them to push that muscle up against their body and create that space. Another way to make them look bigger is to turn their shoulders more square onto the camera because that's going to give them a more dominant presence within the frame. But yeah, light, draw, you know, use light to create shape and shadow um, on those areas that you want to enhance. <laughs> That's it. Let's move on. Or liquefy. <laughs> <laughs> what a cute expression, right? Oh, that's, oh. <laughs> that's a cute shot. And what see that tongue out? Uh, so that definitely an attention grabber right off the bat. The use of flash here is, is unfortunately quite rough on this image. It makes it blue and um, starch against the backdrop. And um, the perspective with shot with a wide angle lens, we get this huge head and the body's just disappearing down there. So. I don't know, you want to take this? Yeah, I, I agree with the, the wide focal length there. It's really created a lot of distortion and made the body of the dog. So when it first comes up, you're like thinking, where is half the dog gone? And then you start to see the paw in the foreground. So obviously dogs are going to do what they're going to do and you cannot direct them like you can a subject, like a, a human. So when they put their paw up there... You know, if that dog's going to put their paw up, I guarantee it's going to put its paw up again. So if you look at the back of the camera once they put their paw up and you can't see separation, reset, change your camera angle, change your body position, move, change your focal length to start and look for a little bit of separation between the paw and the head there because the, the tones, the brightness are very similar so they're merging together and they're not giving us any depth within the image. Like we know that there's depth because of the, the distortion that's been created with that wide focal length. However, we're not getting a lot of depth in terms of what you were saying about the lighting there because it's quite flat on the dog and there's no sort of highlights and shadows to create that depth within the subject. I also feel that there's two kind of separate images here. We've got a beautiful sky landscape and then we've got a dog in the foreground. So it is trying to use your, and I and I get that the paw is mimicking the, the rays of the sun coming out from the sky there. Um, however, they're still quite separated because of that flashlight that's created such a, a, dis, a difference in terms of the background and they're not gelling and working well together. But yeah, if you can look at the sky, you can see that the sun's coming, you know, forward. So you're backlighting the subject. So what you want to try and do is mimic that, but still light your subject in a way, but mimic it in a much better way to create that, that sort of married effect between the foreground and the background. I also would like to add, um, when you do this and the flash hits the rock down there, it's so easy to tone that down in post-process, and that would have kept the focus back to the dog. And also when you have the, this lighting where there hits the dog, the face first, and then it gets darker on the skin 
to brighten that enough skin, I'm sorry, the, the back fur, the, the fur of the body, if you could have, if, if the author could have lightened that up and warmed it up a little bit, because that also gets very cold. So that could have helped to balance the, the dog so that at least had more cohesive exposure and colors. Thanks, ladies. That's awesome. Let's move on to another one. God, how cute is he, right? Look at him in his little suit. He's the cutest little thing ever. I love this. And his, his little hand in his pocket, like you couldn't oppose this kid any better. Um, the light, the intensity of light on his face is so bright in some areas that we're, we are losing a little bit of that tone and texture in those highlights. And the white shirt um, is, is also just a little stark there and, and drawing your eye away from the, the face itself. My advice here, if we look at the shadow um, coming out from the bottom of the feet there on the right-hand side, my advice would be to, you know, pull that light out a little bit further in front of the subject. So we get a little bit less direct light there sort of on them and just soften it by feathering it gently across him because this is a small child. We don't want to use hard light and create that, that hard shadow from you know, or that hard line, that transition from shadow to highlight. We want to soften it and bring out all of these beautiful soft features in these round cheeks. So cute, so cute. I would say that coming down and lowering your uh, perspective a little bit, not shooting so much from above here, would have given that boy, so, because he's in a suit, he's been a big boy. You know, he's like, you know, he's, he's, he's getting older. And if, if the photographer could have come down a little bit and just had that feeling in the angle where he's actually a little bit bigger, that would have been, you know, just giving the story another feel as well. Uh, the hand in the pocket. You, I mean, it's it's still it's a it's it's a cute pose. Maybe you would have want him to, if you could have directed this age, to turn a little bit more so I can see some of that back arm, more of that, or just a little bit more because not right now it's sort of disappearing in the backdrop, we're in the background. So that would have helped just a tad to get. But I'm shooting these these ages and it's not easy to direct them at all. But that could have just helped with that because that if you see below his shoulder with the hand that's in the pocket, that arm is literally this thin right there. And that the other arm looks very normal. So that gives us a distorted feeling. So it could easily been helped with twisting a little bit. Yeah, my yeah, ex I'm I'm totally looking at exactly what's being mentioned here. And the and a really great way to fix this is to create a longer well, create more distance with yourself and use a longer focal length. Like right now, the little boy's head and upper body from his chest up appears so much larger in the frame. So using a longer focal length, moving back and then just tilting up a little bit is going to change this, the overall finish of this so much. And you're going to see a huge variety and you're going to capture less background as well. I think also the, the cropping at the bottom too, just as a tiny bit tight, you know, just a little bit more. All right, let's have a look at another one. Thanks. <laughs> um, <laughs> do you know, I have, I, I did get an opportunity to see this in the online judging. So this is my second time seeing this image and I literally just had the exact same reaction that I had the first time I saw it because I love the colors, I love the pattern and I love this mirrored effect. Um, what I'm looking for when I, I see a photo like this is more direction for the face. So there is a face in here. There's beautiful pattern, but you really want that face to stand out. And at the moment, the body of the gecko is being lit really quite well and, and brightly. However, the light falls off around the head of the gecko. So my advice here would be to change your direction of light and light the face and then focus on the reflection, not so much the the gecko that's closest to the lens. Focus on the eye that's in the reflection, light the face of the gecko, and you would have drawn us directly into that weird, cute little face <laughs> um, so much better. But, you know, I really want to say, you know, well done for seeing something, you know, a little different, a little unique, because this is someone's pet and they love it and this would go really well on their wall. 
The only thing I think I can add to this is I would like to have this gecko. I think it's, it, I love animal prints. I think it's gonna go so well with all the kinds of outfits that I have. No, I, I think that she mentioned it, most of it. Yes. I, I, I'm not sure how you would achieve it because I don't know where this is or what the context is, if, whether it's on something that is black or whether there's just needs a little bit more light to just add a hint of detail in that black because the, the starkness of the black around the gecko is just a little bit hard for me. I'd just like to see uh, a little bit more, but again, if this, yeah, perhaps, yeah, perhaps, yeah. Composition. Yeah. But um, yeah, look, again, taking a single creature against a simple background and being able to give it personality and gesture, I think that's the key here that makes it a strong image. And uh, the lighting aspects that you talked about, absolutely, get some more light in that face that you are presenting us with, even though it's the reflection, is pretty important. Let's have a look at another one. I always like these portraits when they play with the hair. Uh, we've, seen, we've seen quite a few of these throughout the years, but the, you can always make you know, the new twist of it. And I think this was kind of fun and um, playful pose with this girl. This is teenagers, right? Yeah, teenager. Um, however, I would love to have had a little bit more, a little bit more space. She's literally right up against that. Um, that that side on on her, the front of her nose, and it, it wouldn't have hurt the image to have given it just a little bit more space. Also, the lighting here is quite hard on her, and it, the ear is the first thing that actually my eyes goes to because that is so bright. Yeah, I agree. And the expression as well on her face, like she's looking off camera. We don't know what that respect that that expression is referring to. You know, you want to know why does she look somewhat sort of startled almost. So a softer expression or even just like a slight turn of the head towards the camera would keep you in the frame because you've got the ponytail creating a beautiful leading line, you know, and a, and a beautiful curve that takes you on a bit of a, you know, a journey into that negative space. Bring the face, the chin around a little bit more towards the camera keep that nose within the frame of the face and you would have a completely different composition. But here right now, just that stark look on her face going out of frame, it makes you want to know what you're looking at, but we don't have any context because there's nothing there to see. So there's a lot of sort of things here that you can play with in terms of composition, posing, you know, um, uh, expression. The other thing I just want to say, like the... Martina brought up the point about the ear being the brightest part there. And what that does is it then leads you down into that giant earring that's really big. And then it takes you to the necklace because it's a dark line on skin. But we can't see all of that necklace. So it led to different points throughout the frame that don't add to the composition, that don't add to any storytelling elements. And then there's a beautiful bodice of the dress that we're cutting through. So when you're styling, you know, think about the different elements that add to it, that take you, you know, if it's about the hair, make it about the hair, remove, strip it back, take away some of those jewels and make it more about that. But yeah, I think you're onto something that's got great movement in the, the simplicity in terms of the black and white conversion work. But yeah, I mean, I don't know what else um, I'm... Well, I was also going to say when it comes to styling, that you go, uh, that you try to find... Uh, connection between what how what you're going to style it with and the mood of the image if we look at the hair here it is kind of messy and it's got a, 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 a natural feel of that braid coming down and then you have very luxury earrings that are very big and then you have the sparkling bustier and that doesn't really it's it doesn't really synchronize with that kind of messy everyday hair i would have liked her in something more uh, teenagers in something more relaxed outfit or just clean or just a, 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 a draping on her to where we can just keep our eye back up on her hair. Uh, those small necklaces is a little bit of a pet peeve of mine. So I literally, when I have clients and I go, can you please remove the small necklace unless it's extremely important for you to wear it? Because when I'm backing up and shooting a portrait, when I look over, you can't see it's a necklace. You just see a line going through 
the neck. So either remove, they can have rings, they can have earrings, but that little tiny necklace is most often removed. Would this image have been stronger without the earrings? Okay, let's see if we can... Can I just address one thing about the light? Sure. Um, because we talked about the highlight being on the ear. So, and you do want to try and light the ponytail and you want to try and light the face, right? My advice here is, and I'm going to try and explain this the best that I can without drawing it. <laughs> so, when you've got your subject in front of the camera like this and they are side on, if you want to add a little bit of light to the shoulder, a little bit of a glow light, make position that light further back. So distance it further back and point it back towards the subject. That'll avoid you lighting that ear in the foreground. And then the face light, bring that further forward so that you're lighting the face that's closest to the camera. So try to work with the positioning of your lights so that you're lighting the areas that you want lit. Like that's the really important thing here because when you position your light, you have to think, what am I lighting? What do I want to draw the eye to? What is it that I want to, you know, emphasise here within my composition? That's really important part. Absolutely. All right, let's see if we can get one more in and that's probably going to do us. Let's have a quick look at this one. Oh, yes, <laughs> I'm definitely okay to start. There's some love going on over here, right? that I can see the, uh, the connection obviously between those two and it's, it's a fun, it's like graphic, uh, the black and white and the, all the white going on. It's actually nice circle here taking me around this, um, this image round and round all the time. So that's kind of nicely done with the elbow and everything coming in. We're gonna come back to the lighting here. It is extremely stark and the, the dog is so white popping out that if that could have been toned down a little bit, it would have been more balanced to her skin tone. I actually think that the skin tone is handled quite okay, being such a bright light. Um, yeah, I'm gonna have you. <laughs> yeah, do you know what? I think there's a lot of potential here. When we think about creating something different and unique, we've got a, a really out there outfit. And then we have a dog with a really different pattern in terms of that brindle coat. So. When we try to bring two subjects like this together, we have to think what what sort of similarities are they? Now, I'm gonna make an assumption and as a judge, I'm giving feedback, this is a critique, but as a judge, we're not allowed to make assumptions. But here I'm gonna make an assumption because we're critiquing and I'm gonna say that, you know, the black and white nature, the texture of the dog, like there was something in the black and white, um, you know, texture and, and, and um, uh, contrast between the, the petticoat and the black underwear that, that caught the photographer's eye. I don't think that you thought that this moment would happen. When you picked up your camera, I think that this is just a moment that happened and you captured it and went, oh my God, that's a great moment right? This is where we have to identify when a moment like that happens, get rid of everything else in the frame. The moment is the connection between the dog and her, not the outfit. The outfit has nothing to do with this. So if they're going to do this once again, like I said, with the dog putting its paw up, they're going to do it a second time. Mm. Like there is definitely a connection here between the subject, by, between both subjects. So you know, if you can see that if you captured it once, come back and try and capture it again. Do it again. Strip it back. Remove the white contrasting petticoat that has nothing to do with this story. Remove the black cane that has nothing to do with this. This is such a powerful connection between someone and their dog. And that there weighs so much more than all of those other, you know, styling elements that have been brought into this. Um, did you say black cane? There's a I think cane. it's a chair. Is it a chair? And I was just going to say she should pull a hand back oh. away from the camera. Yeah, yes. <laughs> That's okay. But, but it is also... I thought it was a cat. <laughs> <laughs> but it, uh, it is definitely adding to that little bit disturbing uh, disturbance that goes on and her hand cannot be coming forward. I mean, if that would, like you said, pull, being pulled back... It wouldn't have been competing with the attention for the dog. And I just want to mention a little bit of her posing as well. Right now, my 
I'm moving into the darkest area. There's so much brightness going on here. So I'm moving into the darkest area. And you know what that is? That is literally her crotch right in there. And the way that she has literally almost angled that out towards the camera, if that could have been squeezed around a little bit, that would have been, you know, my focal point. Okay, beautiful. Bit more control of light. And the thing is, even with an image like this, exactly as it is, as, as it's been captured, in post, a little bit of toning and just darkening down the dog, bringing attention to the kiss straight away, that would lift this image by five points. I, d I do. Like, I sit here and I think, I would actually love to see the full series of shots that were yeah, taken from this. Because I, I can, I'm, I'm guessing that this was just a moment that you weren't expecting and you went, look at what happened. Because we've all been there as photographers. Thank you, ladies. That was children and teenagers, animals and pets. Martina, Kelly, appreciate you coming in and sharing your incredible knowledge and experience uh, in the way that you do it. Uh, if you get the chance to ever see any of these ladies' workshops or presentations, do yourself a favour. It'll be one of the greatest presentations you go and see. We're going to be back in a short while with Portrait Individual. It port that, start again. And they, these guys won't cut that out, I can tell you. We will be back, and the next one we'll be doing will be Portrait Individual. Uh, with Candice Cowshagen and Michael Novo, who was with us before. Also, I'd like to make sure that we appreciate, or they know that we appreciate, that's B&H. It's been a long couple of days. <laughs> we do appreciate the support of B&H and also Critique. Don't forget to go to iconawards.com. You can see all the other things that are available. There's a book from the awards uh, finalists. There's all, every single finalist they got uh, 80 or above is in that book. A lot of inspiration there. But with that, we'll finish that one for now. We'll be back shortly with the next sessions. Kelly, Martina, thanks so much. Really appreciate it.